But we are continuing our series today on, the, on mastering the fundamentals of faith. Amen. Going to Matthew 9, verse 27 through 29. If you would stand to your feet for the reading of the word of God. Matthew 9, verse 27 through 29. I want to give you a chance, Chris, to get the recording set up if you haven't already. Amen. Thank God for Chris back there. Amen. Uh, Matthew 9, verse 27 through 29. Uh, all of our uh, messages are recorded. For those who uh, may not know that, they're available uh, for purchase in the Resource Center. Uh, we also have uh, messages on demand on our website, on the app. You can watch live online, uh, as I know some are right now watching uh, by way of the Internet. And we thank God for you doing that on this morning. Amen? Amen. Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 27. I'm reading from <clears throat> the New American Standard Bible translation on this morning. And it says, As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. Amen. You may be seated in the house of God. Now, we are dealing with this principle of faith. Amen. The principle of faith, mastering the principle of faith. You know, you have to master this principle, master the fundamentals of faith so that you will be successful in seeing things manifest in your life. How many of you want to see God's promises manifest in your life? Amen. Amen. So as we began our journey last week, studying the fundamentals of faith so that you can master the process and see the manifestation of God's promises in your life in a greater measure, we learned, among other things, that it is necessary to be taught on the process of faith. It is necessary. Let me say it again. To be taught on the process of faith. Even the disciples of Jesus requested that he teach them. In Luke 17 and 5, it says there, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. Next to salvation, faith is the most important topic for the believer. Let me say it again because many people don't know that. Next to salvation, faith is the most important topic for the believer. It's not about, you know, uh, how to, you know, how to prophesy or all of that kind of stuff. Faith is the most important topic. It is clear from Scripture that this is so because it tells us that we should live by faith. How many of you know if we should live by something, we need to be able to understand it, right? The Bible says, and if you have your Bible app, uh, I forgot to mention that on your Bible app, the notes are there for you. Um, so you can just go there, make sure you save the event so you'll have access to those notes later as well. Romans 16, Romans 1, rather, verse 16 and 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. How many of you are not ashamed of the gospel? Amen. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. I think that's just a powerful thing right there. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter, you know, what your family lineage is. Everyone who believes can be saved. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. We see that we should live by faith also when we look at Hebrews 10.38. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 38, New American Standard Bible translation says, But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So since the Bible tells us we should live by faith, faith is a vitally important topic. Faith is not an emergency plan, like I told you last week. You know, a lot of times people get in trouble, and then as soon as they get in trouble, oh, can you pray for me? 
They're, they're trying to pray there. They're trying to listen to, you know, messages about faith. They're trying to, you know, go to church because they're in trouble and they need God to do something. Faith is not an emergency kit that you just pull out of the closet when you need it. Faith should be the normal way we live in every situation. Let me say it again. Faith should be the normal way we live in every situation. You should want God involved in every aspect of your life. Now, the definition I gave last week for faith, in the context of this teaching, is that faith is a super, excuse me, a spiritual principle that taps into the supernatural creative power of God made available to man, whereby man can transform conditions, circumstances, and situations in the natural realm that he has been given authority over. Faith is a spiritual principle that taps into the supernatural creative power of God made available to man, whereby man or woman, of course, can transform conditions, circumstances, and situations in the natural realm that he has been given authority over. So when Jesus told the blind men, According to your faith, be it unto you, he was crediting what they would receive to be directly connected to the development of their faith. Likewise for us, we are going to receive from God based on the development of our faith. Did you hear what I said? Based on our development of our faith, we are going to receive from God. Everything you need God to do in your life is brought about by faith. Every principle, every promise, every prophecy in the Word of God has a faith process to bring it to pass. If you do not know the fundamentals of faith, you will not see the manifestation that God has promised. Now, isn't it an awesome thing that we are heirs to all the promises of God? But while you're here on the earth, there are things that God wants to do for you, but you will not see the manifestation if you don't have faith. We must also remember that we do not have faith in faith. See, sometimes people, when they say they're having faith, they're having faith in some, some mystical thing that's up here in the air somewhere. But we have faith in God. Faith is only as good as its object. If your faith is in God, then you have a justifiable reason to believe that your faith is going to work. How many of you know God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us? All of God's promises are yes and amen. Now, we explained that last week. I'm just doing a little bit of review here. All of his promises are yes and amen. What does that mean? That means if God promised something to you, he will say yes, provided the conditions are right, of course. You can't be living in sin and think that God is going to bless you. The amen part means that if God has said it, all, all, all our response should be is, amen, God. It is so. But too many times believers question God, you know, God, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? How God is going to move is not your business. If he has promised it, he will do it. As a believer, you are expected to live by a new set of rules now that you have been born again. Being taught about faith is important, and gaining an understanding of how the process of faith works is key in mastering the fundamentals of faith. So as we continue today, today I'm going to uh, zero in on the asking component of faith. And uh, the, the three components of faith are asking, believing, confessing. You'll hear that again later in the message. Asking, believing, confessing. I'm going to show you in the Word of God, not my opinion, not what somebody told me, but in the Word of God, you as a believer are supposed to ask God for things. Are you hearing what I'm saying? As I said before, this will be the most comprehensive teaching I've ever done on faith. And all of you have some great things that God wants to do in your life. But those things will not manifest if you are not mastering the fundamentals of faith. You know, I find it interesting that uh, when you ask people if, you know, God raised Jesus from the dead, people have no problem with that. If you ask people, do you believe in heaven? People have no problem with that. If you 
ask people if they want to be born again. People are, are able to receive Jesus Christ and all of that, but they don't realize that that same faith that it took for you to come into the kingdom of God, you have to still exhibit to maintain your relationship with God. Or in other words, to continue to please God, you still have to walk by faith. They don't realize that from the initial point of salvation, they're supposed to continue to exercise faith because the promises of God are received by faith and the righteous are supposed to live by faith. Can you say amen in the house? That's why hearing teaching on faith is necessary. So we're going to do it. Three main points. You have them in your notes there. The first main point is the textbook of the faith process. Now, how many of you, when you were in school, you had textbooks. Nowadays, I don't know, it's 21st century, might have all electronic stuff. I don't know. Uh, you know, because we don't have kids in school anymore, so I even forget when school starts. <laughs> so I just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go somewhere, and I'm like, where are these buses come from? Oh, well, school started. <laughs> so, you know, but you had textbooks. Anybody remember textbooks? Yeah, yeah. Did you like the textbooks? Yeah, so, so, so some of y'all are like, yeah, it's kind of 50 50 in the house. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you had those textbooks, and you needed the textbook to gain an understanding and mastery of a subject. Can you imagine just going to class and you're just sitting in class or you're doing class online or whatever, and there's no book? And the teacher is like, learn this, or else you're not gonna pass. And you had nothing to reference. You're like, how am I supposed to learn this? No matter what the subject may be, whether it is math, which I detest, unless it's multiplication, addition, subtraction, or division. Don't need that other stuff. Science, love science. English, I love English. Psychology, accounting, business, engineering, a particular medical field, or whatever the case, there must be a course of study for the believer. There is a textbook that we must study, must study, can you say must study, to gain a mastery of faith. It is not a book by Tony Robbins, all respect to Tony Robbins. It is not a book by Les Brown, all respect to Les Brown. The textbook that we have to study in order to gain a mastery of faith as a believer is the Word of God. Faith is not based on someone's opinion. It's not based on your feelings. Faith is clear and dependable and laid out for us in the textbook, which is the Word of God. How do we know that faith comes through this textbook. Well, go to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 is very clear, easy to understand. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What is the word of God? That is the textbook for uh, the development of our faith. Notice it does not say faith comes by hearing the opinions of other people. Does not say it comes by how you feel. Too many Christians are too caught up in feeling something. They want to feel. You know, the people you say, I want a religion I can feel. What is that? <laughs> something you can feel? You know, people think when they get saved, you know, they might feel something. I didn't feel anything. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, believed in my heart, God raised him from the dead, and I was saved. I didn't run around the church. I didn't do a cartwheel. I didn't pass out. I didn't flip. I didn't jump over seats. I just have to, had to have faith that what God's word said was true. But in our church culture, you have to pray for our church culture because a lot of times we, you know, want to feel stuff that the Bible doesn't even tell us that we're supposed to feel. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Before a person becomes a Christian, faith is stirred up in them to receive Jesus by hearing the word of God. Another scripture that confirms the value of the Word of God is 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says there, all scripture, can you say all scripture, is given by inspiration of God. Let me just pause right there. The Bible was not just man's thing that he just came up with. 
So people need to stop saying the Bible was written by man as if man thought up the whole thing. The Bible, true enough, was written by man as the tool in God's hand, but it was the Holy Spirit that inspired the Word of God. So the Bible is an inspired book. It is God's Word, and if we follow it, we will receive what God says. Amen? Amen. Let me continue. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, there are four words to take note of in those two verses. Number one is doctrine. What is doctrine? A lot of times people think doctrine is a bad word. Doctrine is not a bad word unless it's bad doctrine. <laughs> Let me say that again. Doctrine is not a bad word unless it's bad doctrine. If people are talking about there's no trinity, that's bad doctrine. If people are saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that's bad doctrine. If people are telling you, well, you don't have to go to church, you don't have to give, you don't have to believe in the Holy Spirit, you don't have to do any of that, then that's bad doctrine. And there are people teaching bad doctrine. The Bible tells us there will be false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. We cannot be naive. We have to wake up in the body of Christ and realize that everybody that straps a collar around their neck and opens up a church does not mean that they are called of God. The Bible is our textbook, and it is doctrine. It shows us, this is what doctrine is, the order of God. We will see from a faith, uh, we will see faith, rather, from a different perspective when we understand the order of God. Faith is not hard to understand. Another word to understand there in those two verses is reproof. Reproof is the dismantling of error regarding our understanding of how faith works. Number three, correction. Correction comes by exposure to truth. That's something that a lot of people don't want to hear these days. Truth, in a lot of people's mind, is uh, like hate speech now. People don't want you to tell them the truth. They got their own truth. How dare you? Who you think you are? I got my own truth. Like, oh, okay. All right, we'll see how that works when you die. Let's see if your own truth gains you entrance into heaven. Let's see how that works. And guess what? You won't be able to come back and try a different truth or the real truth because once you're gone, you're gone. Instruction is the fourth word. Instruction is simply a systematic way of doing something. And uh, as a result of this teaching, uh, as you'll see, there will be a systematic way for you to understand faith and understand how to exercise faith to get results. Now, it's necessary for us to be exposed to the Word of God, but it's the teaching of the Word that brings about an understanding of how to apply it. Uh, Proverbs 20 and 5, Proverbs 20 and 5, a uh, powerful scripture, says this, counsel in a person's heart is deep water, but a person of understanding draws it out. Counsel in a person's heart is deep water, but a person of understanding draws it out. In other words, uh, counsel is like a well. So let's just say the Bible is a well. There's a, so much information in the Bible. But if you don't know how to draw out of the well, it does you no good. You can stand there, look at the well, hope that something comes out of the well, run around it, jump up and down three times, Whatever the case, if you don't know how to draw out of the well, it is not going to help you. You can clap your hands. You can, you know, do whatever, run around the building. It's not going to help you if you don't know how to draw out of the well. That's why we need to be taught the Word of God so that we can apply its principles to our life. The Bible is the textbook we must study. And then number two, there are expectations of the faith process. So there is the textbook of the faith process. Then there are the expectations of the faith process. When we are actually walking by faith, and I say actually because a lot of times people think they're walking by faith and they're not walking by faith. They're walking according to their own reasoning. They're walking according to what they can understand, what they can comprehend, what they uh, have the power uh, to affect on their own because they got enough money. They, they got enough connections or whatever the case. That's not walking by faith. When you're walking by faith, it's not dependent upon what you see. 
When we are actually walking by faith, we must understand that there are some expectations of the faith process that we must recognize and respect to get results. Now, there are five expectations I'm going to give you. And they're not listed in uh, any order of importance. And, uh, you know, God won't necessarily give you all five of these, you know, every time you pray it, it ba based on the situation. He can, but it's not necessary that you might need all five of these in every situation. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So first of all, uh, one of the expectations of exercising faith or one of the expectations of the faith process is that God will give you a plan of action. God will give you a plan of action. Let's say you want to start a business. Well, you go to God in prayer. God will give you a plan of action. Don't just think you're going to start a business and it's just going to come out of the cloud somewhere. God will give you a plan of action because he is that kind of God. Number two, God will give you wisdom. He will show you the correct application of natural and spiritual knowledge for your success. God wants to give you wisdom. How do we know that? The Bible says in James 1 and 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Not ask Facebook, not ask Instagram, not ask, you know, uh, grandma, although grandma might have wisdom. God has all wisdom. Because sometimes, you know, you can ask people for some wisdom and you find out that really wasn't wisdom. <laughs> Who gives to all generously, not just a little bit, generously and without reproach. In other words, God is not going to get upset with you for asking him for wisdom. And it will be given to him. So God will give you a plan of action. These are the expectations of the faith process. God will give you wisdom. Number three, God will give you favor. <laughs> How many of you know favor is better than money? Favor can get some stuff for you that money cannot buy. God will give you favor. And the Bible tells us that it is God who blesses the righteous and he surrounds them with favor as a shield. But the favor I'm talking about as an expectation of the faith process is favor that is divinely motivated. God will motivate others divinely, supernaturally to help us. They don't even have to be a Christian. God can move upon some businessman, you know, to just, hey, you know what? I've been observing your ministry. I've been checking out your business, and I just want to just bless you with this check for $200,000. And you're like, glory, what church you go to? I don't go to church. They just wanted to be a blessing to you. God will divinely motivate somebody to do that. God can motivate anyone to help you. So God will give you a plan of action. God will give you wisdom. God will give you favor. And number four, God will give you a miracle. This is one of the expectations of the faith process. God will give you a miracle. How many of you ever experienced a miracle? I mean, it's something that you know you had nothing to do with. People said it couldn't be done. That nobody had anything to do with it. It was just you know it was God. I can tell you, Pastor Val and I can tell you a, a few times that it was just nothing but a miraculous move of God. Now, a miracle is a sovereign move of God whereby he overrides natural laws to bring his will to pass. I remember one time there was a lady. She, uh, she came to church, and uh, she had uh, cancer that had metastasized. Uh, she was at stage four at the time, I believe. And uh, she received prayer, and that lady lived for several more years. And the doctor said, you're only going to live for a few more months. That was a miraculous thing. The doctors couldn't do anything. Nobody could do anything. There was no medicine for it. It was nothing but a miraculous move of God. And I can tell you a number of other things, but I don't want to take up all the time with just testimonies. We have absolutely no control over miracles. We have no control over miracles. If we are walking in faith, and God wants to move in a miraculous way, that is totally up to God. We shouldn't try to predict miracles. And, uh, you know, we certainly shouldn't try to live by miracles. You shouldn't need a miracle every week. <laughs> every day, God, give me a miracle. It's Monday. 
God, I need a Tuesday miracle. Wednesday, God, I need another miracle. No, you shouldn't live by miracles. You should live by faith. The miracle is up to God. We should live by faith, and our faith will bring results. Let me say it again. Our faith will bring results. I want you to say this just so you can hear it in your own ears from yourself. Say, my faith faith will bring bring results. results. Number five, God will give you strength to endure. So God will give you a plan of action. God will give you wisdom. God will give you favor. God will give you a miracle, the fifth expectation of the faith process. God will give you strength to endure. How many of you, when you're praying for something and it's not manifesting right away, you get tired, you get weary, and you're ready to just throw in the towel? Anybody ever been there? I see your hands. Yes, we, we can all probably raise our hands on any particular situation. We've been praying for God to move on our behalf. We've been praying for change. We've been praying for God to, to do something, but it has not happened yet. That does not mean it's not going to happen. Walking by faith does not guarantee that things manifest immediately. As you patiently work the faith process, God will strengthen you. And I think uh, many times with the faith process, when you're working faith, when you're walking by faith, uh, that that waiting period that, that strengthens you is for your good. Because imagine if, if God just gave you everything like right away, you'd be like, you'd just be kind of spoiled, wouldn't you? Imagine if your parents, when you were growing up, they just gave you everything like right away. You didn't have to do anything. You just, you know, just because I'm alive, just give me that, you know. That's not how it works. God will give you strength to endure. We need faith and patience as we operate by faith according to God's word, not our feelings and opinions. We will need to come to the realization that God is an orderly God and there is an order to the faith process. It's not about what you can see. Hear this. Reliance on things you see with the natural eyes nullifies faith. So far, we have seen, number one, the textbook of the faith process, which is the Bible. Number two, expectations of the faith process. I gave you five expectations. And number three is the order of the faith process. Hebrews 11 and 3. You can turn there if you like or write that down. I think I put that in your notes uh, for, for reference sake. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared or framed by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Notice that God, who is a spirit, spoke words and things came to pass. He created man in his image and makes man able to speak things also. Man is essentially a speaking spirit. Man, we are body, soul, And spirit, we are a spirit being living in a body. We possess a soul. We are tripartite. That's what the Bible says, not making anything up. But man messed up, a man messed up rather, but God makes the redeemed man, one that has received Jesus, a man of faith. For the Bible says in Romans 12 and 3 that God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Therefore, every man... Every woman has the capacity to frame their world with the words of his or her mouth in alignment with the word of God. Now, you just can't say any old thing. You have to, you know, speak in accordance with God's will. But you can frame your word with the words of your mouth. What you imagine has a direct correlation to what you speak. And one thing I learned, I was listening to one of, my, uh, one of the teachers I listened to, and he said this. He said that, uh, everything really has um, uh, two origins. And I think that's what the word he used. And basically what he was meaning, an idea is an idea before it's a real thing. So you might have an idea for a business, let's say, but then you have to work the plan God gives you for it to actually manifest. Even in Scripture, you can see how God was speaking to man in Genesis. I don't have time to go there right now. God was speaking to man in Genesis, and then later on it says God placed man in the garden. Well, if you study it, God was speaking to man in spirit form first, and then he placed the man in the garden. We can, I can show you that in Scripture. Just don't have time to do it right now. 
However, this is where a lot of people will part company with you because they don't think that God is a God of order. This is where the, the, the separation comes between the, those who really believe in faith and those who really don't believe in faith. People don't think that God is a God of order. They think God just does what he wants, and we just sit back and wait for God to give us what we need, and we dare not ask God for anything. If that was the case, then everybody would get saved. If God just did what he did, because the Bible says that it is the will of God that all men be saved and unperished. So if God just does what he wants, how he wants, and whatever, and we don't have to have any involvement, then everybody would just get saved. The Bible clearly says otherwise. God works a certain way. And if you tell some people that God is a God who works in an orderly fashion, they think you're discrediting God or taking something away from his power and authority. These people are oftentimes those who are trying to live by miracles and not live by faith. We can see the order of God all around us. Think about it. We have day and we have night. We have seed time and we have harvest. We have winter, spring, summer, and I think my favorite of all, fall, because I was born in the fall, you know, praise God, Thanksgiving and all that. We have order <laughs> in our physical bodies. Think about it. If you need heart surgery, the doctor is not going to just start cutting in random places. Well, need heart surgery. Let me start cutting. Mm, let me see. Let me try around the knee area. See if I can find this heart. No, they're not going to do that. Why? Because our bodies were created in an orderly fashion. No matter who you are, no matter what the doctor is, no matter what the hospital, who is operating on you, they know where your heart is located because God is a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14 and 40, it tells us this, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly fashion manner. What I see across the body of Christ, so many believers don't have order. They don't believe in order. You can see it in the nature of some church services. It's just anything goes, whatever. Anybody, just get up and say anything. Everything is like chaotic. No order. Church don't even start on time. We'll start when the people get here. No, we're supposed to start at 11, but, you know, we wait for a couple more people to get here. We'll start at 1135. That's not order. And people of God, well, should be on time, too. That's a whole other message. God is a God of order. And if God is telling us that all things should be done decently and in order, guess what? God is not a hypocrite. If he's telling us we need order, then God has to be an orderly God also. We see order in Mark 4, verse 26 through 29. And it says there, and he was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night and gets up by day. Again, that's Mark 4, 26 through 29. And the seed sprouts and grows. And I like this part, how he himself does not know. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. The soil produces crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The only thing you need to know how to do is how to function in faith. As far as how the results are coming, you don't need to necessarily know all that information because God will handle it in response to your obedience to walk by faith. Can you say amen in the house? Amen. We can expect faith to be progressive. So basically, uh, just like Mark 4 describes the progressive nature of crops resulting in a harvest, there is a progressive nature of faith. There is progressing toward the manifestation of what you're believing God for. When you respect the progressive nature of faith, you won't get frustrated. For example, let's say you're believing God for a raise on your job. You get a five-cent raise, and you feel a little bit disappointed. But guess what? That's just the blade breaking through the soil. That's just the beginning. Your faith 
it's actually working. Before you exercise faith, you didn't get nothing. Now at least you're seeing some manifestation of what you're looking for. Are you in the house this morning? Jesus gives us insight on the order of, faith, of the faith process. In Mark 11, 23 and 24, it says there, Truly I say to you, New American Standard Bible, uh, whoever says to this, uh, this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. Let me read that last part again. Therefore, I, Jesus talking, say to you, all things, can you say all things, for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them and they will be granted you. You know, basically, you have to see something before you actually see it. You have to see yourself in that house or in that car or with that child or being married or whatever before it happens. That's what the scripture is saying to you. It says, believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. In the context of these verses, we see the components of faith that we're expected to apply. There is the, first of all, the asking component. We see that in the text there. We see the believing component. And there is the confession component. Now, you might not see that too clearly, but if you believe that you have received something, then you're confessing that you have it. An easy way to understand and uh, remember, rather, the, uh, the ABCs, uh, you call them the ABCs of faith. Ask, believe, confess. Just remember that. Ask, believe, confess. ABC. Ask, believe, confess. That's the faith process in a nutshell. And we need to know that the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. So, you know, having faith and not having any corresponding action, your faith does not work. For example, if you're praying for a job, you won't get a job if you're not looking for one. You're not updating that resume. You're not putting any applications out. To this day, I'm 51 years old now, and to this day, I've still not seen anybody walking down the street from Dell handing out jobs just because somebody said a prayer. I still have not seen anybody from any major company, AMD, IBM, whoever the case, I haven't seen anybody walking down the street, knocking on people's doors randomly, saying, you know what? We heard in the air that you prayed. And we just want to hand this job to you. That's not going to, that's going to happen. You have so many people that are sitting around wanting a job, but they're not doing anything. They're not working their faith, not putting corresponding action to their faith but, and, and seeing the, the faith manifest. You have to do something. You don't foolishly presume that a company is going to come knocking on your door because the spirit told them that you wanted a job. If you want your degree, you won't just randomly go to the mailbox one day. Boom, there's a bachelor's degree in the mailbox. Man, God, thank you. That's not how it happens. You have to look for the school. You have to apply to the school. Then you have to burn some midnight oil and just about quit school <laughs> to end up with the degree. If you want God to bless your finances, you must tithe and give in accordance with what his word says. You need not ask God for all grace to abound to you if you're not a giver. Doesn't work that way. You don't need to ask God to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive if you don't honor him with your tithe. Your faith is useless if you do not have the corresponding action to go along with it. Faith without works is dead. The Bible gives us many examples of the faith process working. But we want to go to the example of Abraham in Romans 4, verse 17 through 21. Go there with me. Romans 4, 17 through 21. Awesome passage of Scripture here. Romans 4, 17 through 21. It says there, are you there at Romans? Amen. 
Romans 4, 17 through 21, it says, As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him who he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, not respect to what he saw, what people said, with respect to the promise of God. So I ask you, what did God say to you? He did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured or fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. People often don't want to learn how, to, how faith works and feel it doesn't take all that. However, when you know the laws of a system, you can maximize the system. For example, to live in America, how many of y'all know all the laws of America? You can just, just right now just spit them out. Just like, boom, law number one, boom, boom, boom. How many of you know that? No. You don't have to know all the laws of America to live in America. But you need to know certain laws to get your rights as a citizen. The same applies in the spiritual sense. You need to know the law of faith and how it works in order to get what is your right as a citizen of the kingdom of God. How do we know faith is a law? Well, the Bible describes it as such. Romans 3.27 says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. That word law in the context of Romans 3.27 is the word nomos in the Greek, the original language, which means a rule or law concerning a natural phenomenon or the function of a complex system. Now, when you look at Abraham's situation, Abraham was faced with a whole lot more than what many of us will ever face. <laughs> Consider this. He was promised a son at an old age. He was about 75 when God promised to give him a son. Now, some of us, if the Lord showed up and said, you're going to have a son and you're 75 years old, you would say, that's the devil. <laughs> You'd be like, hey, God, God, is that you? No, that must be the devil talking. A son at 75? Listen, I told uh, Pastor Brown, I was talking one day, I said, you know what? Uh, it, we are empty nesters now, all five kids, glory to God, are out of the house. And we got a house to ourselves, praise him. <laughs> we love them, but they out. <laughs> we can have it as cold as we want in there. We can have it as hot as we want. I mean, we can do whatever we want. It's just us. They're out of the house. But if all of a sudden, the doctor said, Miss <laughs> Hooper, it looks like, and I'm not even going to say it. <laughs> We'd be like, Lord, no. <laughs> That's Abram's situation. Look, look at this. God said he'd be the father of many nations, but he didn't have any children yet. Think about it. He's an old man. God tell him he's going to have a son. He's going to be father of many nations, but he doesn't even have one child yet. And then we look at the situation there. The natural function necessary to produce a child wasn't working for him. And then his partner, Sarah, it says her womb was dead. She even laughed at the prospect of a baby. Over in Genesis 8, uh, 18, 11 through 14, I'll read it to you. It says, now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. My God. 
Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, if you read that story in, in, in that chapter, uh, three men came, and they told him how they were going to have a child and all that, and uh, they asked where Sarah was. Abraham said she's in the tent, and uh, she was eavesdropping, basically. And, uh, you know, the man said that the son was coming, and, and Sarah laughed, and she tried to deny it. If you, if you read the whole story, she tried a lot to deny it, and they said, no, you did laugh. Shall I indeed bear a child? And it says here, and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I indeed bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. So he was promised a son at an old age. He was about 75 when God promised to give him a son. God said he'd be the father of many nations. He had no children yet. The natural function necessary to produce a child wasn't working. Sarah's womb was dead. She even laughed at the prospect of a baby. And everything in the natural they needed to produce a child was out of commission. They probably didn't even have the natural desire to engage in such activity. If you're expecting a raise on your job, at least you have a job in the first place. They didn't have anything to work with. You have at least a job. You're already making some money. You're just asking God for some more. They didn't have any kids. God has promised them. But everything wasn't working. Nothing they were looking, uh, nothing uh, in the natural was looking promising for a child to come forth. Nevertheless, and I like Abraham's faith. Abraham is called the father of faith. Romans tells us that he was 100 years old, still having faith to believe God. And against all odds, he had corresponding action to go along with his faith. In light of Abraham's actions and Sarah's, because Sarah had to be a willing participant, you know, Sarah already came up with one plan before, and it did not, you know, pan out well. She, they created an Ishmael. Here's some questions for you. What are you believing God for? Is there anything too difficult for God? And here's the, the big one I want to ask you. Are you fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to perform? God wanted them to have the child of promise, but he could not give it to them until they re released their faith for the manifestation. And there's so many things God wants for your life, but he will not force them on you. He cannot give them to you until you receive it by faith. The problem for many people is they don't want to work the faith process. That's too much work for them. They want stuff right away. You ever notice in our society right now, people want stuff like now. You want to be famous? I want it now. I want a record contract now. I want a book deal now. I want everything now. I want a house now, car now, everything, job now. I don't want to wait for anything. I don't want to do anything. I just want you to give it to me. Now, 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 now. And that's how people treat God. They want it now, but they're not ready for it yet. They want God to give them everything without having any involvement in the process whatsoever. If God did that, he would go against his own word. Another problem for many believers is they lack the patience to see the manifestation come to pass. Think about this. If Abraham, listen, he, he, God told him that when he was like 75, and the Bible tells us right now when he was 100, he considered not his body now dead. You know, he, he was fully persuaded. So check this out. When he's 100 years old, he's like, Sarah, come on, girl. You know what time it is. Think about that. 100 years old, talking about having a child. If you saw somebody come in the church right now, talking about their 100, and understand, Sarah was like 90-something, 90, 90, 91, somewhere in there. Can you imagine seeing a 90-year-old woman walk in here pregnant? She's 90. That thing is all out there. Well, it's like, bam. And you're looking at him, he's a hundred years old. Like y'all are having a baby. How come y'all waited so long? <laughs> that was the promise of God. 
It was like 25 years from the time he got the promise to the time the manifestation came. So my question to you is, why can't you wait? People don't want to wait 25 minutes, 25 days. Lord knows if it, if it, if it required 25 years, some people would just, just leave Christianity probably. 25 months, they had to wait 25 years. If they had to wait that long, we can certainly wait a little bit. If you have battle in patience, fret not. All you have to do now is work on your faith and be confident that God is going to move. But let me zero in more on this asking component of faith before we conclude. Faith is initiated with petitioned prayer. You should not be embarrassed about asking God for things. Let me say it again. You should not be embarrassed about asking God for things. And you don't have to put a spiritual twist on it every time you ask God for something. I'm going to show you that here in just a minute. If you want to ask God for something, if there's something you want, just ask him. Matthew 7 and 7. It tells us, the Bible tells us, ask. It says in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. You must be comfortable with asking God for things. You, like Abraham, must be fully persuaded that God's word is true and act accordingly. When you know what the Bible says, you will, be, you will not be persuaded by people who lack faith to operate in a different way than what the Bible says. See, a lot of people, and see, that's why you got to make sure you control who, it, who gets in your ear. You got to control who your circle of friends is because you might have friends that you didn't know that they didn't have faith until you started talking about having faith. And they're like, girl, man, you know, that's stupid. How come you walk, walking by faith? You got the money. Just go do what you need to do. No, nope, that's not walking by faith. I'm going to touch on that in just a second. When you know what the Bible says, you will operate by faith. John 16, verse 23 and 24, it says this. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. That's Jesus talking. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. It says, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be full. Clearly, the Bible says to ask. It is okay to ask God. Religious people will criticize you. Religious people will say, you just want something from God. Well, yeah, I do want something from God. God says I can ask for something from him. It's okay. It's your right to ask your heavenly father for things so your joy may be full. Here's another scripture that uh, people seem to just completely miss when it comes to asking God for things. John 15 and 7. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Only a person void of a biblical knowledge will tell you that you don't have to ask God for anything. The Bible says to ask. Here's some examples of asking. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. First Chronicles 4 and 10. And uh, Pastor Val touched on it earlier. Now Jabez called on the God of Israel. See, even though this was in the message, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, that it may, uh, that it, uh, may not pain me. And look what it says. And God granted him what he requested. Jabez got what he asked for. Hannah, over in 1 Samuel, she had no children, and she went before God asking for a child. And let's look at what 1 Samuel says in uh, 1, uh, verse 19 and 20. It says, Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. He remembered what she asked for. It came about in due time after Hannah had conceived that she gave birth to a son and she named him Samuel saying, hear this now, because I have asked him of the Lord. She received because she asked. Hear this. You have not because you ask not. Don't get mad with God if he hasn't done a particular thing for you that you've not asked him for. Ask him that you may receive. God gives us boundaries, however. 
concerning our asking. You know, there's some, uh, some things that qualify uh, the validity of what we're asking for. In other words, you can't go and uh, ask God to give you, you know, your neighbor's house. Yeah. You know, ask God, God, give me, you know, my neighbor's wife. You know, you can't ask for stuff like that. Those things are out of bounds. Those things you will not receive and you'll be eternally frustrated because God has not given you things that are out of bounds. He won't do it. It's not a qualified desire. That is covetousness. But 1 Timothy 6, 17 says this. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. And look what God does. It says, who gives, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. It's okay to want something from God. How many of y'all, there, there's some particular thing that you want? It, it could be a house, car, whatever, it, it's, whatever. It's something that you want from God. Every, everybody, everybody should want something from God. I mean, if you don't want nothing, I mean, come, come on now. God, wants, God has the ability to give you everything. You should want something from God. Amen? But people think they have to put a spiritual twist on their request for God to accept their request. Listen, I've said before, God, you know, I, you, I, you heard me say, I, I think that the ultimate car is a Mercedes-Benz S550. If any of y'all want to write a check today, you can do that, write it to Calvin Hooper in the amount of however much it costs, and I'll go get one. Or if you just want to get one, park it outside for me, I appreciate it. I'll drive it in your honor. <laughs> but guess what? You know, I pray to God for it, but I don't pray like, you know, God, I want this Mercedes so I can pick up people for church in Jesus' name. No, I don't pray like that. He says, he'll give me all things richly to enjoy. I just pray because I want the car. I think I look good behind that wheel. Just cruising through the streets of Round Rock. Put some chrome rims on it. <laughs> you don't have to try to con God to get what you want. You want a house and you pray, God, you know, give, give me a house so I can house the homeless. You ain't going to house the homeless people. You ain't talking to homeless people now. How are you going to put them in a bed in your house? If you want it, just ask God for it. God didn't say you got to put a spiritual twist on it. God, I want, a, I want a job so I can, you know, I can give to the church. Well, if you don't give anything to the church now, you're not going to give anything then either. People don't want to hear that. If you want these things to enjoy, simply ask God because you want to enjoy them. You don't have to put a spiritual twist on everything you ask God for. It is in his will. He wants to give things to you. Even in Matthew 6, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If you read that whole chapter, there's no spiritual gift listed there that he's talking about. He's talking literally about stuff. <laughs> 